Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this year's uh, first lecture in the Arise series. Um, and uh, my name is Alex Lopsky. I am from the University of Otago, and we will be the main organizers of the event. But we appreciate all of your participation and also all of your talks uh, in the coming months. So today we will, I will uh, do the start, giving a short introduction about what this is all about, and also uh, the first topic on uh, eye, gaze, eye tracking in extended reality. In one second, sorry. Okay. Um, so the Arrive uh, Consortium is a consortium of Australasian uh, researchers from New Zealand and Australia, and. It is one of the largest AR-VR uh, network communities internationally, and um, the whole goal is to create a network between uh, lead class leading class, world class uh, laboratories within this area to um, promote the research in our area. And it was initialized by professors Mark Billinghurst and Bruce Thomas. So the goals of the Arrive Network are the teaching uh, to develop AR, VR training materials uh, for use be between all of our partners. And this is what we are doing here. Um, and the goal end goal is to create well-trained AR, VR researchers. So we want also to share uh, the research resources and know-how and facilities so that we can grow a thriving community. And finally, ideally, we would like to also commercialize the uh, outcomes of our work. So the main partners of the ARRIVE network uh, are the University of New South Wales, Auckland, Monash, Canterbury, and also uh, here in, um, not, not, not only New Zealand, but also in Australia, we have um, Queensland, Wellington, uh, South Australia, and Otago. So I was very um, frank to copy these slides from Holger from last year. And if you want to see any of the talks that we did last year, where we covered the basics of XR research, you can just go to our website um, that you can see down here to watch any uh, of the talks. And we had a lot of very interesting talks and big thanks to our partners um, within Australia and New Zealand for that. So, while last year we were focusing primarily on covering the basics of uh, XR research, uh, this year we want to go a little bit more uh, state of the art. So uh, this year we asked everybody to make only one lecture. So last year it was two classes. This year uh, we want to do only one class. And our goal is to cover areas that have not seen uh, representation last year but also provide more information about the state of the art and also some of the work that our partners have been doing in the last um, year since the last Arrive series. So we will be starting out today where I will be talking about uh, the state of the art in eye tracking in extended reality before moving on um, on Thursday to the applications of extended reality in sports uh, presented by Steffi here on my left. Probably you cannot see. <laughs> um, and then we will continue throughout uh, the next couple of weeks uh, giving presentations from all over the area. And uh, you can see that there are still two topics that will be decided uh, where I'm talking to some of our partners about uh, the details of the presentations they can give um, for this series. Uh, the goal. The ultimate goal of uh, the series in the end is to not only share the knowledge, but also serve as a basis for a panel discussion that we will do at the end of the series uh, to bring everybody um, up to date to have a discussion about potential uh, future challenges that we all see um, and would be an interesting uh, avenue if, of future work. So without further ado, uh, let's get to the first topic. So I want uh, today to talk to you about a survey paper that we did uh, over the last couple of years. And uh, this paper is currently in a minor revision, uh, but 
I think I can share it with you because uh, it, uh, it was only a single blind format. So if you're one of the reviewers, you already know the paper. And the whole idea of this paper, it started out actually um, more than four years ago by now. Uh, in, back in 2018, when we organized a shonen seminar in Japan. Uh, so we had a big gathering between researchers from all around the world discussing applications and challenges of extended reality in uh, um, and human computer interaction. And at that time, we had a small breakout group where we got together to talk about uh, eye tracking applications. And our conclusion was that we were not aware of many applications that go beyond a simple look at this uh, point and let's act let's use it for selection. So it was very basic well interfaces with very few variations of it. And so we wanted to know, is there anything else going on uh, in eye tracking? What are the common areas of applications? And there are many reasons why this is becoming so exciting. We have several commercial uh, products in the, uh, being released in the recent years that all include eye tracking uh, capabilities. We have uh, on the AR side, we have the Magic Leap, we have the Holland Zoo, we have also the Varjo HMD, which all already provide eye tracking capabilities from the get-go. And on the VR side, we have the HTC Vive, we have the FOV, we have Pupil Labs that you can integrate into different HMDs. Uh, we have now also the HP OmniSense. So all of these devices now include eye tracking because it is seen as the get to go. Uh, people recognize that it is important. And so we wanted to know, okay, are there really applications in um, interaction that, are, that warrant this application of eye tracking? That what are the main application areas? What are the sub areas in these? And what would be some interesting future trends? So with the emergence of um, the, uh, the commercialization of eye tracking, so making it easier to access, um, the pupil apps was a very big step towards this. Because before that, you had only very expensive devices like the Tobi um, or the SMI eye trackers, which co would cost 10 to 20,000 US dollars. And suddenly you had some devices that you could buy for a thousand dollars or even less, and that you could put into HMDs. So with the emergence of uh, these devices, we can see that the number of publications that are looking at eye tracking per year has been steadily increasing. Uh, until about 2010, you see we have less than 20 papers per year. And then since then we have had so many papers and every year it is getting more and more and more. So uh, the cutoff date actually uh, in 2019, 2020 here is uh, back in uh, May. So you can see that already the number there was actually quite uh, quite high. And to select our papers, we did uh, first we searched uh, the Scopus um, database, and we had some terms that um, relate to eye tracking and um, some terms that relate to extended reality. And this resulted in a stunning number of 1,278 publications. So out of these, we had to remove papers that we thought have no relationship to XR, don't have, uh, we cannot access, and we had even one paper which was a clear plagiarism. So this resulted in 856 papers in the end that we had to look into a little bit more details. And when we looked at common um, application scenarios, we found that there are papers that are looking at user studies, case patterns and system application papers were the most common ones uh, with several studies on perceptual and diagnostical, um, diagnostical studies following that. But these are not really uh, um, for interaction. They are really looking at gaze patterns, uh, how the gaze is behaving in the, under different conditions. And if you can use this, for example, to identify um, ALS syndromes, um, or if you can um, diagnose some um, medical conditions from eye tracking. So instead, when we looked only at the um, 
interaction uh, area of eye tracking, we found that we had 99 papers that were looking at explicit interaction, 53 papers that looked at the implicit interaction, and 63 papers that looked at collaboration in XR. So what do I mean with this? Um, Explicit interaction means that the user has to consciously engage the eye track ideas in some way to interact with the content. Uh, for example, by looking at the area or following the target that they are looking at. Implicit means that uh, the system is using the eye gaze in the background. The user doesn't have to engage it consciously and the system is adapting in some way uh, to the user's gaze. And finally, collaboration means that the IES is being used to communicate some type of cues or is being used in some ways uh, to adjust the collaborative scenario. So looking a little bit in more detail, we found that there are various applications. We can see that there are some applications for explicit IGAS use that look only at um, interactions using eye tracking. So they don't want to use anything else. But there's also a large body of work that is using eye gaze in combination with some other um, modalities like gestures um, or uh, brain computer interaction interfaces. For implicit inter uh, interfaces, we found that there is some work that is looking primarily on the spatial arrangement and some work that is primarily looking at the visual representation of the information. So how do we change the way we are presenting this information. And then there's a large body of work that is looking specifically at changing some rendering parameters of the um, interface according to the user's eye gaze. Now, uh, the collaborative gaze interaction, we look, we saw that there are four main uh, areas, uh, the eye movements. We have um, the adjustment of the eye movements through avatars and when users are uh, interacting with the virtual avatar. We have some uh, sharing of the gaze in remote space, and we have also some sharing of the gaze in uh, collaborative environments where both users are in the same environment. So the difference here is that remote, one is local and one is very far away. And for uh, the same environment is we are sharing the same uh, virtual or real space. Now, before we go into all of these uh, areas, I want to briefly talk about uh, the general properties of the eye for those who have not really engaged with this area of work. Um, generally, we, we have uh, our eye model is very simple. It is assuming, assume it is a camera. We have the retina, which is functioning as the imaging sensor where we capture the, uh, the light. And within this area, we have a small, sub area which is the fovea and this is the area where we see everything in very high resolution everything else on the on the retina is much lower resolution and the further you get away from the fovea the lower the resolution uh, on your camera sensor is then you have also a very small area uh, on your on your sensor which is a blind spot so because uh, this is where the nerves from the eye go to our brain. Uh, we don't have any receptors there. So we have a very small area within our eye where we don't see anything. And then what we usually see from the outside is uh, the iris and uh, the pupil, uh, which is changing the uh, aperture of our camera. So how much light can come into the eye. And what we usually measure is then the optical axis of the eye which is going through the center of this pupil. But, okay, so we, uh, we have the smooth, smooth pursuit, which is the first one. Uh, one second, I'll, I'll just play it back again. So here the eye is moving relatively slowly and is following uh, a target that we are looking at, for example. A uh, second type of move, movement are the saccades, and these are much, much faster. And during this time, we actually suppress all the visual information of our eye because it would be too fast, we would not, we would get nausea, we would get sick from that. And these uh, saccades usually are really fast over large distances. Uh, then when we focus on targets that are close to us, we have divergence. 
So the eyes are moving inwards or outwards to adjust to the dis uh, to better focus on the target, um, which is close or very far away. And finally, we have the vestibular ocular uh, reflex. I hope you can see it down here on the right. So as the eye, the head is rotating to one side or the other, as if we fixate at the target, our eyes will automatically rotate to keep this target fixated without giving us motion sickness. So um, the, uh, the eyes can account for this head motion and keep the image, keep the world model stable for ourselves. And all of these eye movements have been explored and are widely used in all of these interfaces that I will be talking about. Now, first, let's talk about explicit eye gaze interaction. This is the biggest area of work that we have found, and this is the most, uh, com most widely explored area. The first type of um, uh, the first type of actions that you can do uh, for explicit interaction is dwell time. Um, as our gaze fixates at a point of uh, interest, it will remain within a small area around this target location. And we will not observe any large saccades, meaning large jumps of our eye gaze away from this location. So if we have some threshold where we say, let's say 200 milliseconds, if somebody stays fixated at this one location, we can assume that they're interested in it and maybe they want to activate this uh, interaction mode. So by doing this, um, we can create a very intuitive interface that simply requires users to look at, at a point of interest. The problem with this is the so-called Midas touch problem. Uh, anybody knows the legend of King Midas? Nobody here? Uh, King who touched, yeah, uh, wished that he turned anything to gold, to gold, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So King Midas wished that he could turn everything to gold, even though through his touch. What he didn't think about is that he will not be able to eat anything anymore because he converts everything into gold. And in terms of eye gaze interaction, this means that we will be triggering interaction that we don't actually want to trigger simply because the system is misunderstanding the input signals from our natural exploration of the environment. And the common way of uh, addressing this is to use very strict thresholds. Um, you could, uh, for example, say that the dispersion of the visual gaze needs to be needs to remain within one degree. So it's very fixated at once, one singular point. You can also use much larger thresholds uh, for detecting your interaction. Um, a common duration is somewhere between half a second and two seconds. So the longer you ask users to look at the target, the more you can be sure that this is exactly what they want to do. But at the same time, this is coming at the cost of uh, speed and potentially would tire out your users. Another type of interaction that has been widely explored is smooth pursuits. Uh, the idea behind smooth pursuits is to explore the um, pursuit type of motion of our eyes by asking them to follow a gaze target, uh, to follow the motion of a target, and then correlating the recorded eye gaze to the motion of this target. So for example, if we observe these two um, objects moving around, if we simply focus exactly at follow one of them with our eye gaze, we can correlate the eye tracking information to the motion of the object and determine what object the user has been looking at the whole time. And this is probably the object that the user wants to interact with. However, the trajectory, the uniqueness of the objects, the number of objects, et cetera, can affect the time and the accuracy of the selection, potentially affecting the end results and the reliability of the method. Now, we have also observed that there have been many systems that have explored different types of eye gestures. For example, some systems ask the user to perform a very specific eye pattern, um, which then can be translated to the, um, to the system to, to trigger some type of input. 
Uh, for example, you can see here on the right, um, we have a two-step or a three-step interaction. So the user has to go from the center to the left and then back. So we, sh we measure the eye movement between two fixations. And if it is matching our gaze pattern that we have in our database, we assume that the user has triggered this action. Now, you, this requires very distinct patterns and needs to be learned by the user. So this is not very intuitive. Others have done uh, some combination of eye tracking with blinks or half blinks to confirm the selection. So you can create a blink pattern, like blinking twice or three times uh, to make sure that this is very distinct. And they also found that combining this with develop timers even incre further in enhances the robustness uh, of the system. Now, there have been some systems that have also explored divergence aspect of the eye. What this means, <laughs> what this means is as uh, we by asking the users to consciously change divergence of the eyes. And um, while looking at an object, this in triggers the system to determine that, yes, this is a very volunteer op uh, selection step. And so we can um, avoid the problems with the dwell time. But at the same time, verging at a different distance consciously is very difficult because this is violating your vergence accommodation um, of the eyes. So accommodation means that uh, the, the shape of the lens is adjusted to focus at a, at a given distance. And then you try to change the vergence, which is coupled with the accommodation. And this is not very intuitive. But some people have also applied this uh, to select objects in depth. So there are some applications of vergence um, as a depth indicator, for example. Now. Given all of these techniques, we have seen that some studies have explored the application of eye gaze compared to other uh, input modalities. And here we saw that the results were quite conflicting. So some people found that eye gaze is less fatiguing and more natural than head gaze. But the overall conclusion is that head gaze is more accurate. At the same time, looking at different studies, as they use different hardware, they also found sometimes conflicting results. So one study says that eye gaze is actually more fatiguing or is more accurate than head gaze. However, the overall conclusion looking at all the studies that we have seen um, is suggesting that eye gaze um, will be less accurate than head gaze because it's less stable. Um, and we, when we talk, think about controllers, it's again depending on the application. Uh, in some scenarios, uh, people observed that through eye gaze, users were less attentive to the uh, had less situational awareness. They were more distracted on their interaction. They were slower. But then for some other applications, for example, for targeting, um, it performed very similar to a controller. So the selection of the eye gaze or your in, in how you use eye gaze for explicit input here uh, needs to be considered in the sense of the application. Now, going even beyond uh, just using eye gaze because there are clear limitations of the selection process, many systems combine eye gaze with other input modalities where eye gaze is being used to look at the target, to point at an object of interest, and the other modality is being used then to uh, select some information about it. Um, so, for example, he, on the top right, you can see the work from Ann and his colleagues. They use eye gaze to select different keyboards that they're seeing on the HMD. And then they use the input on the HMD, so the small uh, control pad, to then select within this small area of selection, um, within this sub area. And they found that this was actually performing better than just using, using the keyboard. So we see different uh, combinations of eye gaze with hand gestures, head rotation, uh, some of the traditional input methods like mice or keyboards. And we have 
seen only one paper that was using IGS in combination with speech. Uh, one con uh, consideration could be that uh, until recently, speech recognition was not very robust, uh, and maybe this will be uh, taking off from now on. But there are also some other privacy concerns, for example. We have seen uh, some uh, papers that were looking at the vestibular ocular reflex. So this is when you rotate your head while your eyes remain fixated at a target. And this has been shown to better distinguish between depth, but could also be used, for example, for navigating tasks if you want to continuously use eye gaze uh, in, some, in a variety of modalities. And finally, we have seen a couple of works that we're looking at combining IGIS with brain computer interfaces, in particular with event uh, related desynchronization um, and steady state uh, visual evoked potential. What this means is, as the target, these two targets, they are, um, they are changing at a different frequency. And by looking at the eye tracking information as well as the brain computer interface, we can see similar um, signals uh, in the BCI corresponding to the visual change um, within these targets. So, for example, here we would see on the left, we would see a very fast flickering of your, on, on the BCI. And on the right, we would see a much, much smaller, res uh, um, slower response to match the frequency of the, tar uh, of the object. So combining these two, you can um, end up at a much more accurate uh, selection. Now, when we look uh, towards implicit eye gaze interaction, we found that there are not many works. This was the least represented area within our uh, review. And the main application for spatial presentation was an adaptation of 2D interfaces to the HMD, primarily in a desktop setting. So some ideas were adjusting the transparency. For example, here on the right, you can see an example uh, where the um, visual overlay gets uh, blended out when the user is focusing on the field in the background, and then blended back in when the user is, is changing the divergence to look again at the screen, uh, at this information, which is much closer located or changing the location. So for example, uh, shifting the, uh, the information slightly to the left or to the right, depending on the user's case. We saw very, very few context aware systems that are changing the, what, where the information is presented and how, much inform, uh, how it is presented depending on the user's uh, current state of mind or for example, the environment. Uh, while some papers have suggested this, uh, they have not really implemented these kind of interfaces. They have primarily focused on estimating what is the user feeling right now, how confident he is, but then they have not really applied this to the interfaces in the end. Now, in terms of visual presentation, we saw that um, there have been some works that were trying to adjust how the information is presented based on the user's focus. Um, for example, here at the bottom, you can see bottom left, you can see that as the uh, user's gaze um, moves away from the object, the indication is changing. So we see uh, when the gaze is relatively close, it's just showing a big uh, eat text box. And as the gaze is moving further away, it's changing to a red square to try to attract the user's attention closer to it. Now, this kind of visual changing and visual uh, guidance has been, we found a lot of papers that were really looking at this area of uh, work. Uh, they were looking into subtle gaze guidance in particular. That means that just uh, changing the indications on the, uh, um, of the information, for example, by brightening it slightly or by creating a slightly zoomed in visualization, try uh, these, um, modifications try to attract the user's gaze to this area uh, that they're looking at uh, without necessarily creating this, the feeling that they are actively guiding the user's gaze. But uh, some, a study that has uh, from Gregory et al. that has compared 
a number of these techniques was, said that while they found all of them performing relatively well or very uh, very similar, none of them were really imperceptible. So over about 50% of their participants felt, uh, noticed that something was being changed and this was not only within one particular technique, it was distributed among all techniques. So there's no technique right now that can really guide the user's attention without making them aware of it. And there still needs to be more work about how to change the visual, visual presentation, because again, this is all mostly in 2D. There's not really a 3D exploration of this. Now, the last area that we looked at for implicit interfaces was rendering. Uh, we have we had many papers on rendering in in general, but we wanted to look at general directions. We didn't want to do a very in-depth review of this area. So the general observation is that many rendering techniques they try to replicate the human perception. Uh, there has been an extensive focus in recent years, in particular, on foveated rendering. That means that we try to adapt the rendering quality. Uh, depending on where the user is looking at. If you recall that we have the fovea, which is very small, and this is the only area where we see everything in high quality. Everything else, the quality, the rendering quality is falling off. So if we can change, if we can estimate where the user is looking at, we can, for example, well, blend, make, render everything else in lower resolution and spend less resources on this. So maybe speeding up the rendering process, making it uh, more accessible, being able to create larger field of view HMDs, which everybody seems to want. Everybody's complaining that the field of view is too, short, too small. So the general, generally, we have two approaches to this. We have a fixed resolution display, and we change uh, the rendering quality according to the user's case. Or we put two screens in, into the HMD. And one of them is low resolution or relatively low resolution, but covers a wide area. And then a small inset has a very, very high resolution for a very, very small area of the HMD. And then you have to physically shift this high resolution area around the screen. Now, some studies found that if you can do the whole pipeline within with a latency of 50 to 70 milliseconds, this may be even tolerable for rendering of foveate, for foveated rendering. And there's, as I said, there's a lot of work, especially looking right now at 5G rendering um, going forward with untethered HMDs, for example. Another area that we saw were attempts to replicate the depth of field effects. So as the user is focusing at, you can see it actually, if you look at my image right now, um, on the camera here, you can see me very nice and sharp, but the background is completely blurred in, in Zoom. <laughs> uh, and you can see similar effects here on the presentation slides. So what this means is, as because the background is at a different distance from the area that you are focusing on, the, uh, this area is appearing blurred uh, in our eye because the lens and our eye is fixated at the given distance. You see the same effect if you have a camera, for example, um, and you focus at something very, very close to you, everything else will be blurred out, everything else uh, because it's too far away. So there has been some effort at replicating these kind of effects in VR as well as in optical c HMDs. So here uh, you can see on the left from the work from a healer uh, and his colleagues, as, as the user is focusing at the arm of these, this character, everything else gets blurred out uh, to replicate this kind of cue. And here on the right, you can see uh, a work by uh, Damien Rompapas, uh, one of my students back at NICE. And what we did was uh, to change the rendering quality of AR content as the user was focusing, let's say, at a at objects at different distances. Now, an interesting uh, effect we have observed recently was that the resurgence of uh, 
<clears throat> interest in circuit uh, suppression. That means that as the eye is moving at a very fast speed to a different location, um, the our visual senses suppress all the visual information to prevent us from getting motion sickness. And during this time, we can change the appearance of the virtual content. So it is widely used for redirected walking, for example. So trying to navigate users to rotate while walking straight forward, um, or to make them think that they have rotated and move them around the room accordingly. But uh, recently, there has been also some work that was looking at adjusting the content that the user is looking at. So whenever the user is looking somewhere else, they will, uh, for example, insert here on the right, you see a puzzle piece at the bottom there, which was not there before. So the user will not notice that the environment is changing because their attention is somewhere else. And during the circadian suppression, they will not be seeing anything else anyway. Now. In terms of collaboration, we have this was our second largest area of work. And here we have observed um, mainly two directions. The first one is replicating eye movements and eye behavior. So uh, studies have looked at the importance of eye gaze in conversations and how important it is to replicate realistic eye movement. Um, and they found that this was a very strong predictor, not only of whom you're listening to, but whom you will be also talking to. So you can see if I'm talking to the students who are here, or if I'm talking to the um, to the, everybody online, they uh, can support conversations when we have multiple actors, so not only one on one, but multiple people uh, in the same environment. And they are also important to for users to identify with their online avatar. So if you have a virtual avatar and you don't correctly replicate the user's case cues, uh, you will be diminishing the, this realism and self-identification. Now, similarly, if you create uh, the gaze models for your virtual avatars, the more realistic they are, the better. So the more realistic the behavior of the virtual avatar's case, the more it, it is reacting to the user's um, case input, so where the user is looking, the more realistic uh, this avatar is being perceived. It is especially important that the when the user is looking at the avatar, potentially the avatar is looking back, um, or when the user is looking at a certain location, that the avatar is also on, uh, changes their case behavior and is looking at the same location. So we have a mutual gaze and gaze feedback that is playing a very important role in um, human avatar communication. Now, the same aspect actually expands beyond simply uh, AR and VR. We can also see that when we apply uh, this with HRI, with robots, we similarly see uh, that um, replicating the user's gaze, replying to the user's gaze um, is creating a more uh, increasing realism and uh, is increasing the um, collaborative um, sense in this environment. Now, when we are sharing gaze skills, on the other hand, um, again, uh, we see already benefits by sharing the gaze skills in one direction. So it is imp improving co-presence, it's improving performance. And it doesn't matter if you share the gaze cues from the local user to a remote expert, or if you are sharing the gaze cues from the remote expert to the local user. In both cases, we can see an improvement in collaboration and performance. However, if we share it both ways, we see even uh, more improvement because simply the users can share the gaze with each other and they have a better understanding of each other's mental models. It is also very important interesting to see that uh, some studies found that head pointing may be even may be better than uh, sharing gaze. So if you want to navigate, uh, if a remote expert wants to advise a local user on how to perform a task, indicating uh, the objects that they are talking about with head gaze may be better than with eye gaze because it is more accurate and is um, more reliable as we have seen uh, during the uh, 
<laughs> terms <laughs> during the explicit um, interaction. Now we uh, we, we also see similar results being replicated in uh, local collaboration. So highlighting of gaze cues is very important. It is improving the collaboration. It is improving the performance of uh, users in the same environment. And it is also help, uh, gaze here is better than um, eye gaze is better than head gaze in helping users distinguish between uh, disambiguities. So if you have um, objects that you're describing that are very similar, eye gaze is helping users distinguish between uh, these objects in cluttered environments. And some studies have also found that providing gaze history even further improves the performance and is further improving uh, the understanding of the users about the other's intentions and the other's um, um, focus and attention. Now, one big caveat to this is that most of these studies have been conducted in VR. Most of the studies on local collaboration have not been replicated yet in uh, augmented reality environments. So while we expect them to be the same, to find similar directions, this has not been proven true yet. Um, potentially, just because we can see the, uh, each other's eyes, it may be less important. Now, when we look back at everything that we have uh, discussed so far, we try to come up with uh, to understand some future directions that the research could be moving into. Uh, one uh, main direction for explicit uh, interaction was uh, uh, the need for a baseline for comparing different techniques. We need common metrics and common questionnaires. For many studies, we have found that they have used different measures in terms of uh, performance rate, speed, um, uh, acceptability, ease of use, etc. So having some common baseline would be very, very beneficial for the, uh, for future research. It is also, uh, we see a lack of determining, of studies that determine the benefits of the proposed uh, methods over the existing techniques. And we don't see any longitudinal investigations. So we hope that in the future, we can go away from studies that are very, conducted in very constrained environments, very constrained uh, conditions to more, towards more um, in the wild studies that are really showing the efficacy of these techniques. For implicit interaction, we found that the current techniques, current applications are often very simple and even presented only as prototypes without any user studies or with very, very lackluster user studies. We, we think that uh, applications of activity recognition and mental state estimations will, uh, will play a very big role because they can be applied to create adaptive interfaces. And given that this in, uh, was suggested by many papers, but not really implemented, we think that um, there will be many papers coming from now on that will be looking specifically at this application area. And it is important to note again that most of those interfaces have targeted only 2D environments. They have not really explored the 3D aspect of extended reality. So they were literally looking only at labels, only at desktops, and they were not trying to explore, explore the 3D nature of the environment. And finally, for collaboration, we think that there will be some extension to um, better understand how miscommunications due to latency affect uh, communication with avatars. And we think that there will be more focus on conveying subtle information like micro expressions or facial gestures to further enhance the realism of the avatars. Um, and again, we, we think that there must be more estimate, more focus on estimating of 3D gaze locations to go beyond the 2D aspect of the interfaces that we have seen so far. Now, of course, there are some limitations to our work. Um, the first one being our search terms. We had very specific terms and very, uh, that we looked for, and several papers that we later found have not matched our terms. They simply used saccades or pupil 
uh, or let's say um, I movement, which are all not terms that we have used in our uh, term search. So potentially there are papers out there that are related, but that we couldn't find. Uh, our work, even though we found 856 papers that were using eye tracking in some sense, we focus on a very, very limited scope of these papers, particularly on interaction. There are many other air important areas that would require further exploration and are really of interest right now. For example, privacy or studying of different gaze patterns uh, given certain modifications of the rendering. Now, uh, one could also argue that we did not conduct a very detailed analysis of each area. So we didn't look, for example, what type of eye trackers did the different environments use? Was there, what is the change of eye tracking technology from 1993 to today? What is the quality change, rendering change? Uh, did, could this have had an effect on the findings? And in the end, we also did the classification ourselves. So we, we talked about the criteria, but in the end, it was up to each of us uh, to assign the paper to a different classification. So to summarize, eye tracking work in interaction for XR is a very exciting area of work. And, but unfortunately so far, only explicit input has been extensively explored. And there are way too many papers that are using simply uh, dwell uh, for eye for selection. So um, to, there are also too many prototypes or only conceptual systems and there are still many interesting directions for further exploration, like perceptual rendering and 5G, adaptive and context-aware interfaces, or gaze guidance in 3D environments. So with that, I would like to thank you all and would open and open the discussion. If you want to ask some questions or make a comment, please just raise your hand. I cannot. Uh, okay, yeah. One second, I'll just. Heads up displays are becoming more common. Um, this around, I guess, occurs in heads up displays. Well, if we have not explored heads-up displays as such. Uh, the we had one or two papers, I think, in our review that have been using heads-up uh, displays that as uh, that were related to head-worn displays. So they came up in our uh, study, um, and I think the applications that we saw there were also very basic, simple uh, content position change uh, based on the user's case direction but uh, we have largely excluded uh, any other papers that have probably that would have fallen into this category. Okay. Um, okay, uh, I think everything else is just a discussion in the chat. I didn't see any other questions. I, I uh, yeah. Any any other questions? If anybody can. Uh, uh, Alexander, thank you. It was pretty riveting stuff to listen to, and look at. Um, purely from a human point of view, sensory input is important for us as as normal human beings, not only sight but hearing and other sensory inputs. And it's interesting that we track just eye tracking when sensory other sensory input actually works with and what sometimes detracts from that input because you can get distracted by sound and all the rest of it so it's not as simple as we try to it's interesting we say focus but it's not as simple as that because when we want to know where the dinosaur is we're actually listening to not only looking do you understand what i'm saying so I guess in our research, how do we how do we deal with those confounding variables which 
impact on our research? Um, or, or do we just notice, note that they're there? I think so. So from the interfaces that we have seen so far, most of them uh, just had only one input queue. So there was only eye gaze and maybe um, uh, the, in collaborative environments, there was uh, some input from the other side, so from um, user user uh, feedback, but this was correlated to the eye gaze. Um, <clears throat> because, but I agree. Uh, I think maybe there were some papers in our studies, um, in our paper search in particular on eye gaze patterns that have explored the correlation of eye gaze with other cues. As, as you say, audio cues will automatically attract our attention. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, we have not seen anything of this in our interfaces. Um, so I, I guess where I'm coming from, I come from a, a simulation, medical simulation thing, and clinical yeah. human factors are pretty important things for human beings to understand situation awareness, yeah. fixation, fixation error, et cetera, et cetera. So those, those human elements uh, are impact or fed by sensory input or lack of sensory input or diverted sensory input. So it's important to think of the context of what we're trying to do here uh, using this sort of technology. And it's important that we do it, but we also need to know is in what context can it be applied and what do we have to consider uh, some of the other drivers. That's all. That's all. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree and I think maybe this is something so we haven't seen this again, um, but maybe this is something that could be explored in, in the wild studies to see how does it actually perform when we have other sensory input that is interacting with the eye gaze. I guess. Yeah, look, look from a, say from an intensive care perspective, I've got a person in a bed who's showing signs and symptoms that should tell you that they're septic, but I'm, I'm not picking up the right cues. So I'm, I'm got a bit of a fixation error on something else. So h how can some of that eye gaze be used to our advantage to help clinicians make those right visual cues, get those right visual cues, sort and sort out all the black, the, the white noise, and get the right diagnosis? That, that's that's where I'm coming from. Um. Unfortunately, I don't, have, I don't have an answer for that. I, I'll just leave the point stand as this is something that needs to be explored. explored. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, th I'm throwing that into the explora exploration bag. So there's lots of people listening so they can come up with some ideas. Thank you. Okay. If, if there are no more questions, then uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you all in two days on Thursday, 3 p.m. Um, here on Zoom again. Um, yep. Push that his talk. Thank you.